Whoa. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fall lecture series for 2022. I am Carrie Soden, the Archaeological and Research Director of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Thank you all for being here uh, and signing up and joining us here in person, as well as those of you that are joining us online. Um, tonight is the first night of our fall lecture series for 2022. Uh, I think, as I mentioned back in the spring, we made a couple of tweaks. You should be able to um, turn on and get closed captions if you need it. If you are having any issues with your Zoom portion, please log out and then log back in. It seems to fix most of our problems that any users have been having. having. If anything were to happen to your feed tonight, be aware we are recording this and we will have it up on our YouTube channel by Monday morning at the latest. And I'll be sending a link out to everybody who registered tonight so that they can see that on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will have a Q&A period at the end of the talk. Uh, for those of you that are here in the room, just raise your hand. And those of you online, please post in the Q&A. Now, I'm excited tonight to be, have a, a program about a project that I've actually been privileged enough to work on for the last two years. On April 11th, 1944, Lieutenant Frank F. Moody, a Tuskegee Airman, was doing a training run over Lake Huron when he crashed his P-39 and died. Here to tell his story and the story of the aircraft is the Michigan State Maritime Archaeologist, Wayne Lusardi. Wayne has been involved in nautical archaeology for basically all of his adult life, getting his degree with, uh, from East Carolina University and working on a slew of exciting projects, including Blackbeard's Queen Anne's Revenge Project down in North Carolina. I'm very pleased to have Wayne here tonight talking about this important project that he's leading. Wayne, it's all you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this evening with us. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just do a real quick sound bite. Good. I'm going to go with yes. Yes. All right. Excellent. So I have been the state of Michigan's maritime archaeologist for the last 20 years, and my primary focus over the last two decades has been the shipwrecks of Michigan. There are about 1,500 or so shipwrecks in Michigan waters in the Great Lakes. And Many of those are quite historic. Most of them are from 19th century, early 20th century, uh, but a, a real great variety of um, lake craft that are here in their wreck state. There are also lots of other archaeological and historical resources in the Great Lakes around Michigan and the Great Lakes around everywhere. And that includes paleo landscapes where people hunted and lived 9,000 years ago, and these landscapes are now inundated, and some of them are in 100 plus feet of water. There are also docks and piers and lighthouses and other sorts of historic structures like that. And there are also lots of airplanes. Seven years ago, when I first became interested in the potential for aviation archaeology in the Great Lakes, uh, I knew of only a handful of aircraft that were found in Lower Lake Michigan, a lot of the Navy airplanes that were training and doing carrier qualifications during the Second World War, and then a couple of civilian aircraft that were up here in the Thunder Bay area in Alpena, where I live. Um, but over the course of my research in seven years, I've created a list and a, a database, and I have something like 1,100 aircraft accidents of all varieties in the waters of the Great Lakes, and the number is just really staggering. But when you start to look at it uh, individual case by case, it really be, it is no surprise that there are a lot of airplane losses off of Cleveland and Buffalo and Chicago and other places where the airstrips are literally right at the water's edge. So the vast majority of aircraft accidents in the Great Lakes are civilian and commercial, but the military is also very well represented here, including Tuskegee aircraft that were utilized by the first African Americans to train for the United States military during the Second World War. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to share my screen here and, and start with the presentation. All right. So the Tuskegee Airmen uh, we all know a, a little bit about them, but we don't know all of the particulars. And I knew very, very little about them seven years ago. And it wasn't until the discovery of this airplane in Lower Lake Huron uh, that I really started researching them more and more and becoming more and more impressed with what they did, the challenges they overcame, the obstacles that they overcame. So the Tuskegee Airmen were the first African-Americans that were allowed to fly, to be trained and to fly military aircraft for, for the United States. 
and this occurred beginning in 1941. There we go. So in 1941, in the spring of 1941, the Roosevelt administration was very well aware that the United States was eventually going to enter the Second World War. And what they did is they began what was called a civilian pilot training program. And that basically were civilian programs that were throughout the United States, mostly at universities, including Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where young men and women would learn how to fly. And then if and when war broke out, the United States needed pilots, then they could draw off of these already trained civilian pilots. And Tuskegee Institute, which is a traditionally black college, it was developed in the later 19th century. The first president was Booker T. Washington. It was a place to give formal education to descendants of freed enslaved African-Americans. And it became one of the civilian pilot training program uh, universities in the United States where there were many, many dozens. And if you look at places like Willow Run outside of Detroit, you can, in, in the height of the Second World War, they can turn out a bomber, it seemed like every couple of minutes. And it was much easier and quicker to train, to manufacture aircraft than it was to train pilots. It took a lot of time. And so this civilian pilot training program was sort of a precursor to that so that there we would have a big pool of pilots here in the United States. In 1941, Tuskegee Institute was further selected by the United States Army to become the first place to train African American men to become fighter pilots and bomber pilots for the United States military. They organized in a the first class was only about 12 men. Uh, rotation for the next five years or so, they would do a, about a class of 20 or so men. And over the course of World War II, about 990 Tuskegee Airmen pilots were graduated from the uh, program. And then many of them went to advanced training in, in some places, and then others went overseas ultimately. In the first couple of years, it was a slow process. The United States Army Air Corps had no intention of integrating African-American troops and pilots. And so the first batches of airmen that succeeded in their flight training uh, formed up the 99th Fighter Squadron, but remained at Tuskegee for almost two years. And it wasn't until the spring of 1943, that the first Tuskegee Airmen were sent overseas, first to North Africa, then to Sicily and Italy, where they spent most of their time as fighter escort pilots for the bombers that went deep into Nazi-occupied Europe. So the 99th stayed at Tuskegee, Alabama, and trained and trained and trained and added to its ranks until being deployed in 1943. After that, the 100th, the 301st, and the 302nd fighter squadrons were developed at Tuskegee, and they compromised the or they uh, comprised the 332nd fighter group. But instead of remaining at Tuskegee for all of their training after they earned their wings, all of the fighter pilots then were deployed to Selfridge Field in Mount Clemens on the shore of Lake St. Clair near Detroit. And all of the bomber pilots and many of the other aviators went to other places around the country for advanced training. So Selfridge Field is a one of the, is the earliest northernmost airfield in the United States. It was developed during the First World War in 1917. And it was a place to train military pilots to fly in Europe. A lot of the pilots that were being trained ahead of Selfridge Field were being trained in Texas and Arizona and other places where it was warm and where it was dry. And it's a lot easier to start an airplane engine in those kinds of conditions. It's a lot easier to not freeze to death in a cock open cockpit at the time. And so Selfridge Field on Lake St. Clair was really designed to test the, to utilize the climate, the weather, and the geography of Michigan and the Great Lakes to train military pilots that would expect to encounter these same kinds of conditions in Europe. So in 1917, the airfield began. It still continues kind of sort of today where it's mostly a, a Coast Guard a aviation station and some Air National Guard units uh, come and go from there. 
Selfridge Field was named after Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. He was one of the first uh, military flying pilots in the United States Army. And he, Thomas Selfridge was, because he was one of only a handful of pilots at the time, he was quite a celebrity like many of the pilots. And he hobnobbed with people like Alexander Graham Bell and Ford and others folks. And he received his advanced flight training from none other than Orville Wright. Unfortunately, however, uh, in the 1908, in December 17th, 1908, Lieutenant Selfridge was taken off in this aircraft with Orville Wright down in Virginia. Uh, a couple of minutes after the photo was taken, the ship went uh, aloft and it nosedived and crashed into the ground and Lieutenant Selfridge became the first fatal aircraft accident victim in the United States. But this is his namesake field. Now of the Tuskegee Airmen that went through the program in Alabama, not all of them were pilots. And in fact, about 15 to one were not pilots. And so there were just shy of a thousand pilots, both fighter and bomber pilots. But the vast majority of the men and some women that went through the program were armorers, they were radar operators, they were navigators, they were bombardiers, they were mechanics, that sort of thing. And when the fighter pilots beginning in the spring of 1943 started coming to Michigan for advanced training, so too did all of their support personnel. Unfortunately, whenever pilots trained, there were going to be accidents. And during the Second World War, in the United States Army Air Corps alone, in, on US soil, there were almost 16,000 fatal aircraft accidents in the United States during, during the Second World War. The number is staggering by today's standard. If when a Marine Corps helicopter goes down, for example, now and 10 or 11 people die, that's an international tragedy as it, as it should be. And, but I, I can't imagine 16,000 men and women dying in airplane accidents uh, in training scenarios on US soil during the Second World War. The number is just staggering. Of those accidents, 15 of those fatalities occurred here uh, with Tuskegee Airmen in Michigan. And six of the Tuskegee Airmen were killed in the waters around Michigan, one in Lake St. Clair and the others in Lake Huron, lower Lake Huron, where the flights uh, operated out over the water, running up to Oscoda Army Airfield or running over Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. One of the first fatal accidents of a Tuskegee Airman was this gentleman, uh, Lieutenant Wilmoth Sadat Singh, Sadat Singh was a celebrity. He was probably the most famous of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was a collegiate athlete. He went to Syracuse on a basketball scholarship and he was discovered there by their football program and he became a star football player as well. So just an incredible athlete. Uh, following his graduation from Syracuse, he became one of the first African-American police officers in Washington, DC. And ultimately he was drafted into what would become the NFL. And had he survived the second world war, I do believe that he could have been one of like the Jackie Robinson of the American professional American football. Uh, he was really just that good. So Lieutenant Wilmoth Sadat Singh was flying a Curtis P-40 Warhawk, the aircraft that were made famous by the Flying Tigers operating in China right before America's involvement in the Second World War. And he was leaving Oscoda Army Air Base, which was a, originally Camp Skeel. It was a place to have pilots run up from Selfridge and do gunnery exercises. Oh, eventually, Oscoda received its own airstrip and became its own um, base. And of, of, after the war, the Second World War, it would become Ward Smith Air Force Base. So Lieutenant Singh on May 9th, 1943, was leaving in a P-40. He took off from Moscota on his way back down to Selfridge Field, went out over Tawas Point, and something happened to the aircraft that was probably mechanical or engine failure. He successfully parachuted out of the aircraft. The plane crashed in Lake Huron. And unfortunately, before rescuers could get to Lieutenant Singh, uh, he, had, he had drowned in the lake, uh, becoming one of the first Tuskegee uh, fatal accident victims. Another type of airplane was a Volte Valiant. This was a weather observation aircraft or used for weather observations. 
Uh, this one had two people on board. Lieutenant Nathaniel Hill was the pilot and Lieutenant Luther Blakeney was the weather or the meteorologist that was on board. They also took off from Moscow to Army Airfield in June of 1943, about a month after Sadat Singh's accident. This aircraft went out into a cloud bank over at Lake Huron and it never came back. Eventually, some of the wreckage was found and uh, the bodies were recovered from that fatal accident. Lieutenant William Hill of the 15 airmen that perished here in Michigan is the only one that is still missing. He's out in Lake Huron somewhere. He was flying a Bell P-39Q Air Cobra. The Air Cobra was built by Bell Manufacturing out of Buffalo, New York. It was a state-of-the-art aircraft in the late 1930s when it was developed. It was the first airplane really that was built around a gun. So it carried a 37 millimeter cannon that fired through the propeller hub. And prior to this, the idea was you have an airplane, you add guns to it. This one was kind of designed that you have a very large piece of uh, armament and you wanna build a platform to deliver it. And so the Air Cobra was developed. It also had machine guns that were in the forward fuselage that were synchronized to fire through the propeller arc. And then depending on the version, the Q version had a single 50 caliber machine gun in a pod or a fairing one underneath each wing. The engine on the, the Air Cobra was placed behind the pilot and to open up that forward fuselage for the cannon and the machine guns. And so the whole center of gravity of this kind of airplane was very different than the traditional aircraft that were in the US arsenal at the time. So you have the big Allison V1710 engine that's placed behind the pilot. You can see the exhaust stacks kind of sticking out behind a canopy there. And then because it now gave some room in that forward fuselage, it allowed for a tricycle retractable landing gear. And so this was the first in the US arsenal that had a tricycle landing gear. All of the previous fighter aircraft, or most of them, were tail draggers, where they had that small wheel at the stern, like a typical Navy carrier landing type vessel or ship. So this is Lieutenant William Hill. He was operating out of Oscoda Army Airfield as well, went out over the lake to do some gunnery exercises, and then had something go wrong with the aircraft off Harrisville, which is just south of where I live here in Alpena, Michigan. And he went into the lake and unfortunately was killed in that accident. Another Bell P-39Q Air Cobra was being flown by Flight Officer Nathaniel Porter Rayburg. Uh, like Sadat Singh, Porter Rayburg was a, a professional athlete. He was a golfer, a collegiate golfer at the uh, University of Illinois. He was one of only two uh, collegiate golfers in traditionally white schools at the time. The other was Jackie Robinson at UCLA. He wrote books about golf. He was a professional caddy, uh, just an incredible athlete. And he, like millions of other young men and women, when World War II started, wanted to do his party, became an aviation cadet at Tuskegee, earned his wings there, and then became a flight officer here in Michigan. He was flying a Bell P-39, like you see, landed on, at Selfridge, and was over the north channel of Lake St. Clair. Something happened to the aircraft, and he went down. Uh, did a nosedive through the ice into the river and was killed immediately. His aircraft was found about 15 years ago, and it is largely uh, destroyed because of that impact with the river bottom. It's only in about 30 feet of water, and it's spread out kind of all over the place, but there are some pieces and parts that are still recognizable. This is These are the two sections of drive shaft because the engine was placed behind the pilot, it necessitated an extraordinarily long drive shaft, about eight feet in length, that went literally underneath the pilot's seat through the instrument gauges, and then up to a forward gearbox uh, where it rotated the propeller. And these are the two four foot sections of that drive shaft sitting on the river bottom. This is what's left of one of the propeller blades. It's a single propeller with three blades, and you can see it's sort of bent and twisted and colonized pretty heavily with quagga mussels now. And one of the uh, main 
Wheels, the Firestone Sky Champion, that still has air in it from the 1940s. Because he was engaged in live fire gunnery exercises, like most of these airmen were when they went out over water, uh, the ship was armed. And there are occasion you'll see 50 caliber um, munitions laying on the river bottom. So we go to Lieutenant Frank Hemmond Moody. Frank Moody was born in Oklahoma, in Castle, Oklahoma, in December 1921. Uh, if he were still living, he would have just turned 100 of, you know, last year. He was born uh, of a, a migrant worker, a migrant farmer, and a Native American woman. And they, right after he was born, just to, as he was a toddler, they moved, the family moved to Los Angeles. And so Frank Moody grew up in Los Angeles. He had two younger sisters there. And again, when the Second World War broke out, he was working, he graduated from high school, and then he was working for an aviation company in San Diego and became an aviation cadet at Tuskegee. Uh, this is Frank Moody's graduating picture at Tuskegee. There were 20 men, in, including Frank, in his class, 44 B SE, the 44 is the year that he graduated. B is the second month or February and SE means single engine or fighter pilots as opposed to the TE classes, which were twin engine bomber pilots. So here is Frank Moody, uh, his graduation picture in February, 1944. Like all of the other Tuskegee fighter pilots at that time, they were sent up to Michigan for advanced training and Lieutenant Moody was flying a Bell P-39Q Air Cobra, similar to this aircraft, uh, radio call sign 221226. This airplane went, um, took off from Selfridge Field with three other aircraft. They went out over Lake Huron to do gunnery exercises. And Frank Moody, when it was his turn to practice his weaponry, he pulled the trigger, fired, and something happened to the airplane. Now he's going about 300 miles an hour thereabouts, and he's only about 100 feet above the water at this point. Something happened to the airplane. The other three pilots in formation with him reported seeing fragments coming off from the forward portion of his ship. The aircraft lurched up a little bit and then hit the water, cartwheeled, and was gone. And Frank Moody was killed on April 11, 1944. Exactly 70 years to the date later, April 11th, 2014, a, a diver team consisting of a father and son, David and Drew Lezinski out of Port Huron, were diving in that area. There had been an accident with a tugboat and a barge uh, a few years earlier, and they were there to see that all of that wreckage was cleaned up. So when they were taking a look at that wreck site area, they came across a door and an airplane wing. And they realized immediately that they had an airplane, probably a military aircraft based on the munitions that were also on site. They contacted me to talk about what process needed to be done uh, for this aircraft. Should it be left in place? Should it be re-articulated somewhat to make it a more attractive dive site? Uh, it's largely dispersed and the tail is several hundred feet away from the wings, for example. And Mr. Lezinski was interested in perhaps putting some of that together to make it an attractive dive site. And so before doing anything with it, the first thing we had to do is document it from an archaeological perspective. We wanted to map it, record it, do an inventory of everything, do a condition report of the aircraft to make sure, uh, and then to come up with some alternatives of, of what we should do for the preservation of this aircraft. So I assembled a crew. Um, I'm on the, the far end there, and one of my good friends, Eric Denson, who is in the gray t-shirt, is literally a rocket scientist. He's a chief engineer at the Kennedy Space Center uh, at NASA. And I had worked with him documenting a bunch of shipwrecks in the past. And he's a pilot, a big aviation buff. And I gave him a call and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking to look, uh, or want to document a Tuskegee airplane. And he was just beyond excited about that. So he helped me organize a crew of volunteers. And in 2015, we spent about a week out on the aircraft site just to kind of get a, a preliminary evaluation of the site. 
And one of the first things that we did is went to the wings and you can see it just barely uh, kind of visible through the sand there. But um, I'm laying on the bottom. I spent a lot of time just laying on the bottom, drawing and measuring and, and that sort of thing. The white line that extends from me to the right part of the screen is a baseline. It's basically a tape measure that we put down as a permanent fixture on the lake bottom so that we can measure all of the artifacts and all of the aircraft debris relative to that baseline. So we can get a, a very precise map of the entire uh, lake bottom uh, and all of the artifacts that are associated with this aircraft. So right off the, the tip of my slate, I have a kind of an underwater drawing clipboard basically. You can kind of see, I don't know if you can see this here, but there's a five pointed white star here and on the on the side of the wing here and this was uh, is on the port side or on the left wing and we wanted to document the wing we wanted to document all of the artifacts that were around the wing and so this is the drawing that i did underwater they and it shows the wing and you know the components of the wing but also the disarticulated materials that may or may not be associated with the wing and you can see in the upper left hand corner is the red running light. It's a teardrop shaped glass uh, light. The top center image is the armored bulletproof glass. It's uh, about an inch and a half thick bulletproof glass that was right in front of Lieutenant Moody's face uh, as he was flying this aircraft. The upper right is uh, one of those extensions of the drive shaft. And then you can see one of the wheels, the right side or starboard side wheel is tucked up inside of the airplane wing still, and it has air in it from April 1944. And these are the kind of the original positions of some of these artifacts. So in the four and a half days that we were out on site in 2015, it resulted in a basic map of the overall extent of the site. And you can see that it's, it's roughly 500 by 500 feet of materials that are widely disarticulated and distributed across the lake bottom. I wish it was only this small because as we started more and more investigations in later years, we were to find that the actual site is about 10 times bigger than this cluster of artifacts. And we keep on finding more and more artifacts farther outboard of that original cluster. In 2018, we put together a smaller team and we went out and organized a recovery project and working with the National Museum of the Tuskegee Airmen located at Fort Old Fort Wayne in Detroit. Uh, Dr. Brian Smith in the red cap here is the president of that organization. Uh, we worked, I worked for the state of Michigan for the Department of Natural Resources, and we issued Dr. Smith a reco an archaeological recovery permit to begin bringing up the airplane to conserve all of the individual components and then to ultimately exhibit the aircraft in Detroit. So we went out in 2018 and picked up a handful of artifacts that had already been mapped on the lake floor and very well documented through 3D modeling and that sort of thing. And we decided we're gonna, we're gonna pick some of these materials up. We're gonna see how long it takes to conserve these kinds of items and what it's gonna take to bring up the rest of the aircraft. So we bought up the starboard side door. The door, when it was originally found by Mr. Lezinski, they, they thought it was an automobile door and that it was perhaps part of the barge wreck that occurred in that area. And in fact, it is an automobile door. It was built by Hudson Motor Company, who subcontracted the doors for Bell Aircraft Company. And so it literally has a roll down window. It has a, a door handle and, a, and a, even a key to, to get inside of uh, the door. So we bought up the starboard side door. We bought up both of the drive shafts, the extension drive shafts. We bought up the armored uh, windshield. And we bought up the forward instrument cluster. And that was a very important artifact because on it, it has the radio call sign 221226, which positively identifies this specific Iracober as the one that was being flown by Lieutenant Frank Moody in April 1944. You can see the backside of this gauge cluster on how heavily encrusted it is with quagga mussels now. And it takes time 
to dissolve these muscles. This uh, gauge cluster is still undergoing conservation process, even though it's been uh, a little over four years since its recovery. Of course, the last couple of years, there was a, a hiatus because of COVID and my lab was essentially closed at the time, but it's undergoing treatment. Everything that comes out of the water has to be treated. All of the metals are, will, are being corroded by the presence of the quagga and the zebra mussels. And you can't just dry them out. You have to treat them chemically and electrochemically. The wood and aerial mast has to be treated so it doesn't fall apart. All of the glass and everything else that's coming off of the wreck has to go through a conservation phase. And with a lot of patience and a lot of help from volunteers in the laboratory, uh, we can get these artifacts looking not quite brand new, uh, but certainly stable and, and presentable. And ultimately, uh, they will be exhibited in Detroit. So this is kind of a before and after some of the materials. You got the, the armored bulletproof glass as it was on the rec site and what it looks like now after conservation. And then the one of the drive shafts, when it was found, it was heavily encrusted with mussels. It had a lot of rust, uh, corrosion product, pebbles and sand and other kinds of grits that were cemented on um, the artifact because of the corrosion product. And then after about four months of electrochemical treatment and what it looks like today. So the, the process really works. You just have to be super patient with it. And I was able to bring this glass to an air show at Oshkosh and discuss the armored glass and some of the other artifacts from the P-39 with original Tuskegee Airmen. Of the 990 pilots, there are only a few, literally a handful left. And uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel James Harvey, who was a Tuskegee Airman a little bit after uh, Lieutenant Moody. Um, but it was a real honor to be able to discuss these artifacts with somebody that flew that kind of airplane from that time period. This is the starboard door as it was laying on the ground and then a 3D model of it. And this uh, link here at Sketchfab, you can turn and rotate this, um, the, the artifact if you wanna take a look at it. This is presentation is being recorded so you can come back to this link and I also have it at the end as well. After 2018, we decided that the entire aircraft is gonna come out and it'll come up in stages uh, little by little and it will be treated uh, in the conservation laboratories here in Alpena and also in Detroit. And so we had some time to develop a conservation laboratory with Brian's facility down in, in Detroit. And then we had COVID and that kind of shut everything down. But then in 2021, I was able to organize an expedition to the site. We spent three weeks out there and it included about 50 people that kind of rotated through those three weeks, including DNR conservation officers who ran our boats and museum personnel that processed and photographed the artifacts as they were coming up. But most of it were volunteer divers that were avocationalists, just like most of the MAST members that Kerry works with, uh, people that have some training in archeological techniques that were here on their own time and their own expense to assist with this project. And it was a, just a wonderful uh, time and, and really um, an incredible, group of people that all come together to make this happen. So in 2021, we also had a couple of professional archaeologists that were uh, assisting me on the documentation of this. And this was, this was invaluable. We had Hunter Whitehead, who's an aviation and maritime archaeologist down in Texas working for Coastal Environment. And of course, Gary Soden down uh, from Ohio in your group. And these guys were just absolutely invaluable in uh, helping to direct what needed to be done, getting the work done and getting artifacts recorded on the lake floor and then recovered and brought into the conservation laboratory. So forever grateful, thank you. I also had the assistance of the Michigan State Police Underwater Recovery Unit uh, in both 2021 and 2022. And in last year in 21, they bought an IVER, which is an autonomous underwater vehicle and it is equipped with side scan. And they spent uh, about a half a day doing a complete acoustic survey of the entire site. And this was just incredible to be able to see all of the 
of artifacts that are laying down and how they relate to the bottom features and, and geology of Lake Huron. They also provided teams of metal detectors uh, where they would go down and do a handheld metal detector survey and then pin flag artifacts that were subsurface. And then we would kind of hand fan and see what they were and record those through trilateration and offline base, base, uh, baseline offsets uh, around the wing and around the engine area. So these guys were really, really helpful, you know, the last couple of years um, running off of the DNR boats. 2021, the weather was absolutely phenomenal. We had three weeks of near perfect weather. The visibility, and I know that Carrie gets mad uh, every time I talk about 40 feet or so of visibility being pretty poor um, because the visibility last year was 100 feet every day for three weeks in a row. It was just absolutely mind boggling. And this is the wing. This is my son who is a videographer and a diver. Uh, kind of exploring the wing. We spent a lot of time around the wings there. Uh, he's looking right at that starboard side tire that's kind of tucked up in there. And we wanted to really get a feel for what it's going to take to recover this wing and how much material are, is around it. And then we started to systematically uh, document and recover all of the disarticulated pieces of parts in preparation ultimately for the recovery of the wing. We did the same around the Allison uh, engine. This is, a, it's roughly six feet in length and about three feet by three feet. So it's a pretty massive engine. And we spent a lot of time documenting the engine and all of the accompanying tubing and piping and other kinds of materials that are around it, the carburetor, carburetor shutter, and re removing anything that was loose or disarticulated after recording that and then bring that to the surface in preparation for bringing this up next year. And last year in 21, we also did the empennage or the tail fin structure. And because it was small and, and relatively portable, we were able to recover this last year after recording it in situ on the lake floor. Most of the artifacts weren't big and fancy. And, and in fact, a lot of them were completely unidentifiable fragments that are just kind of all over the place. Again, this is a result of the metal detector survey where the state police were pin flagging different materials. And then we would go in, trilaterate, and precisely map each of those artifacts and then do a systematic recovery. And in that capacity, we did about 300 artifacts in total over the last couple of years, most of them being these small fragments, sometimes munitions, things like that. So there was a lot of time spent drawing and measuring underwater. And a lot of time doing circle searches underwater, just kind of going around in loops and trying to make sure that we're covering the entire lake floor once and twice and three times over to make sure that we're not going to miss any piece and part of the airplane. And this is Carrie here kind of running the tapes. And occasionally you get really lucky and you find something that's very far removed from the primary wreckage. This is the control column or the stick. Uh, that was literally in Lieutenant Moody's hand uh, with the machine gun trigger on the top and the cannon firing button up on the very top of the pistol grip. We did recover the 37 millimeter cannon last year. This is about a 280 or so pounds of steel and some of the spent munitions that were there. We found some of the shell casings uh, from the 37 millimeter. And then this was brought to Detroit for conservation. We used, in this case, we used lift bags to recover the cannon. Lieutenant Moody was undergoing live fire gunnery exercises. Obviously, he had machine guns on board. We found all four machine guns, or Mr. Lazinski found all four machine guns. We recorded their positions on the lake floor and then recovered those guns. This is the process of bringing one of those up on the DNR vessel last year. These are all undergoing electrochemical treatment um, to be able to remove all of the encrustation, all of the muscles, stabilize the materials, the metals, and then ultimately exhibit the, the machine guns with the rest of the aircraft.
from the time that the REC site was discovered in 2014, we knew of a single propeller blade that was still attached to the hub. And behind the hub was the gearbox that uh, synchronized the propeller with the machine guns. And uh, through the hub was a socket where the 37 millimeter cannon would have fired. Last year, the Lazinskis found a second of one of the missing propeller blades. And that's the one in the grass that's in the lower uh, image here. And then this year, we found the third and final propeller blade. And if you look at it closely, and you can see it mostly in the one in the grass, about 10 inches up from the base of the propeller blade, there's a hole through it. And all three of the blades have holes through them, two bullet holes each. And what happened for unknown reasons is the when Lieutenant Moody was uh, pulling the trigger, discharging his weapons, something became out of sync, whether it was the gearbox or the uh, extension shafts or the guns themselves or the munitions in the guns, something bad happened. The whole process went out of synchronization. And when he pulled the trigger, he literally, the machine guns shot the propeller blades off of the airplane and the airplane had nowhere to go but into Lake Huron. Through careful mapping and the discovery of that final blade, we found out where this process started. And that's a very important thing. It, it was considerably south of where most of the wreckage is. Um, that's where uh, Lieutenant Moody first pulled the trigger. The blade, one of the blades was damaged enough that it came off almost immediately. And then the plane ended up just taking a kind of a, a dive into the lake. It, it went, it traveled about 800 or so feet before it hit the water. And then the engine dropped out of it, the wings separated from it and skipped across the water. And then the rest of the artifacts went out in sort of a shotgun spatter like that. But it wasn't uh, until we found that final blade that we realized the exact orientation of uh, this accident and how it panned out. And after mapping this, we were able to go to sites uh, where we expected an artifact would be. And in fact, we started finding things that we hoped to find in, because of the precise mapping and the patterning that was occurring uh, uh, when this airplane came apart. So of course, all the work isn't done underwater. A lot of it is topside support. We had a lot more people uh, on the boats than there were in the water most of the time. And we had, again, uh, the DNR guys that ran the boats uh, very incredibly proficiently and safely, but we also had people that helped divers in and out of the water. We had a lot of folks that helped recover the artifacts and then begin the documentation of those artifacts. So they have to be kept wet until they're completely treated. And, you know, so sometimes that's difficult with larger objects. They have to be padded for transport. Uh, they have to be photographed and secured and then weighed and measured and that sort of thing. And so when we got back to shore, we would bring the artifacts to our field station and do a preliminary documentation of each and every piece of uh, airplane that came up. And again, over the course of the last couple of years, that's about 300 objects. So everything was photographed, uh, assigned a number, assigned a card, put into a database, uh, and then weighed and measured and that sort of thing. And then kind of triage to see what, what it needs to, where it needs to go and how it needs to get there as far as conservation is concerned. So this was uh, very time consuming, but really uh, incredibly rewarding. And the archaeology doesn't only just happen on the lake floor, it actually happens in the laboratory as well. And reading gauges and reading serial numbers and reading and looking, finding conditions of different artifacts uh, after the muscles come off, after that grit comes off in that conservation process is just as important as telling the story as it is mapping it underwater. So just kind of quite a lot of, again, recording uh, in preparation for moving these to the lab. Last year, when we were in the process of recording these materials, this gentleman showed up. This is uh, over the course of the last several years, I did a lot of genealogical research. I found out a little bit about the life of Lieutenant Frank Moody. He had a sister and um, his sister married and had a son, Eric Bryant. His son lives uh, 
his nephew, the pilot's nephew lives in Los Angeles. He's a diver and he was able to come out and join us uh, on site last year with his family. So Eric Bryant here is holding the throttle control uh, or the throttle and the mixture control quad quadrant that came off of his uncle's airplane. And the next day we were able to bring Mr. Bryant and his wife and daughter out to the site. My daughter, Eva is a engineering student at the University of Michigan. And she's a big ROV kind of operator uh, all throughout her life. My son in the white cap is a videographer. And so we were able to, to uh, bring Mr. Bryan's family out and put an ROV or a remotely operated vehicle into Lake Huron on a beautiful flat calm day. And Mr. Bryant was able to see his uncle's airplane uh, through the lens of an uh, underwater robot for the first time. And this was an incredibly, incredibly powerful moment bringing together a family um, with a family tragedy and with an archaeological site. It was a very powerful moment. Of course, Frank Moody wasn't the only of the Tuskegee Airmen that were killed here. There were 15 men that died in training accidents here in Michigan. And their sacrifice will be forever appreciated. In late August last year, Eric Denson, uh, the, the rocket scientist I told you about, organized the development of a memorial for the Tuskegee Airmen that trained in Michigan, that sometimes died in Michigan, but that uh, ultimately made the a sacrifice for this country um, and we dedicated this memorial under the Blue Water Bridge in Port Huron last August, and we were honored to have Lieutenant Colonel um, Alexander Jefferson and Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart in attendance. These are two of only about a half a dozen original World War a couple of months ago. Um, but this is a beautiful, beautiful memorial to show the Tuskegee Airmen's contribution to the United States war effort. And beyond that, to show what they had to go through, what they, the perseverance and the obstacles that they overcame, and ultimately their sacrifice for this country and for all of us. And this is the more memorial at night. Uh, I highly encourage uh, anyone that's in the Port Huron area to visit this. I'd like to end usually with a, a group of additional sorts of readings. These are some of the books um, that I reference that are just wonderful pieces of literature. The Red Tail Captured, Red Tail Free is by Alexander Jefferson. He, uh, he was the only Tuskegee Airman that knew Frank Moody personally. He was in a class above Frank Moody and graduated in January of 1944, just ahead of Frank Moody. Uh, he was eventually shot down over France, became a POW in the war, and much of Red Tail Captured is his recounting of uh, being a POW in, uh, in France and in Germany. So some of the references here. And then I'll also end with this slide of some of the direct links that you can go to for additional information about this project and similar projects, the top being my son's YouTube video. Uh, and then my contact information is down on the bottom. If you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to entertain. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and stop sharing and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was it You're was welcome. great. As, I mean, it's one of those as much. It's not that I've spent a ton of time. I think I know things, and then I you always you always tend to um, give me something new, new and exciting. Um, I don't see any questions right off the bat, but I'll tell you. I'll ask mine, which is, you know, okay. So we know this is going to this museum in um, Detroit. Any idea of when some of this might end up on display? or when they'll start being more uh, public access to it? Yeah, so the Tuskegee Museum is located at, at Old Fort Wayne. It is currently closed, but their exhibits are actually um, viewable now at the Charles Wright Museum complex. It's a, a large African-American museum complex in Detroit and the Tuskegee Airmen's uh, exhibit is there currently. And uh, so 
as some of these artifacts are conserved, they'll be incorporated into that exhibit. But ultimately the airplane's gonna take another couple of years at least to recover in its entirety. Certainly the wing and the, the engine are planned to come up in 2023, um, but it's gonna take some time to conserve, um, probably as long as a decade perhaps. But some of the smaller materials that have already been treated are already in the process of, of going into exhibits. Okay, I've got a, a couple of questions about uh, from online and I'm gonna put a, two of them kind of together. One is, um, uh, was Frank Moody's body ever recovered? And then along with that, um, were there any personal artifacts of his that have been found in the wreckage? Uh, good question. So Frank Moody's body was recovered. He was found a couple of months later. There were some kids playing football on the lakeshore near Fort Gratiot Lighthouse and they discovered his body about two months after the accident. Uh, his remains were recovered and then he was interred in uh, his family plot in Los Angeles. So uh, he was in full military uniform, headgear, uh, parachute, the whole works. Uh, there have not been any talisman or personal artifacts discovered on site as yet. And I don't know if he, if he would have had any or not. I, honestly, I don't know. I think that was up to um, individual pilots, but nothing nothing yet. Um, John McFerrin online wants to know if there's any concerns about the ammunition that's that we're finding still being live. Well, you know, it's been in the water for a long time. And so there's a, there's a chance that some of it has been compromised and is inert. Um, but there is also a really good chance that much of it is still live and active. Uh, I've worked on shipwrecks in the Caribbean where that are many hundreds of years old and there is gunpowder in cannons and breech blocks that is still dry and ignitable after hundreds of years in salt water. So it's always a possibility. So what we do is leave as much of it on the bottom as possible that we have recovered a bunch of shell casings. We've recovered the guns, none of which are loaded. Uh, and we've recovered some of the live 50 calibers, um, but all of the 37 millimeters and some of the bigger munitions are being left, they're being recorded in situ, but left on the lake floor. Okay. All right, so now they're coming in fast and furious. Um, <laughs> since there are, since there's air in the tires, could there also still be fuel on board? The likelihood is low but yes is the short answer so it had a number of tanks uh, including uh, bulletproof wing tanks uh, self-sealing wing tanks and there's a chance that there is some fuel in that when we recovered the propeller this year it had still attached the gearbox and there was some oil that was coming out of that we uh made a device to to entrap that oil and then had pads and that sort of thing. We also found the engine primer, the uh, fuel primer, and it didn't have fuel in it, but you could still smell the fuel of it. So there's definitely that possibility. And that's one of the evaluations that we did with the wing and how we're going to wrap that up to make sure that if there is any residual fuel in it, and I don't think there's going to be very much, if any, um, how we'll contain that within, uh, you know, some kind of a the wrapping. Okay. Um, well, here's one that I'll answer. Uh, Bill wants to know what the range of water depth is, and it's 30, maybe 35 feet if you're kind of digging down. And I, and Wayne's not kidding when he says like they think 40 feet of visibility is not great. And I can tell you there were a couple of days we would be working on the wing and I could stand at the boat on top of the boat and look down and see the whole wing laid out there, including, you know, you could see from the surface that white star that's on the wing. So, you know, coming from Lake Erie, um, 30, 35 feet of water that you can see 30 to 40 feet. It, I think it was amazing. Um, I can, you can't even imagine what it would have been like to see hundred feet. Um, let's see here, what, what else do we have? Um, uh, uh, this may kind of go together. Um, Gerald wants to know what percentage of the plane has been recovered. And then Kathy basically is asking, what are the plans for next year? So you can kind of wrap those and in. So the big items that have been recovered so far are the empanage or the tail fin that came up. Uh, the All of the pieces of armament came up. The propeller and all three of it, the blades associated with the propeller came up. Um, the, the radio transmitter is up. Uh, lots of the armor plate is up. 
that sort of stuff. And then lots of skin fragments, rudder fragments, things like that. So overall, you know, I've tried to determine what the overall percentage of the actual aircraft was. And I think it's still pretty small. You know, it's probably five to 7% or so of the overall aircraft, only because the wings are more or less intact from tip to tip. The engine is still sitting on the chassis and that's kind of intact with the carburetor and that sort of thing there. So ultimately the entire aircraft is gonna come up. Uh, we bought up about 300 artifacts so far, um, but you can fill them in a small room. I mean, it, it, nothing was real big except for the empennage and the cannon really. Um, so next year, the plan is uh, if all goes well and, and everything works out and we have um, the boats and the personnel all kind of scheduled out, uh, we'll bring the wings up and we'll bring the engine up next year. And then it'll be a, just a matter of scouring the site and looking for all of the remaining parts of the aircraft. There is very little fuselage that's visible. We found little pieces of skin fragments, but hardly any of it. And I don't know where it went. And so I don't know if it's buried or if it's just so highly fragmented, it just dispersed all over the lake floor. Or what I fear is when the barge and tug sank in that area and there was a major cleanup by divers uh, picking up all of the debris from that, I fear that maybe some of the fuselage might've been mixed in with that group uh, and thinking it was you know, garbage or materials off of the barge. Uh, hopefully that's not the case and we come across these pieces as we start kind of uh, continuing on with the metal detector survey and the recovery of the bigger pieces. Here's a, a good question just, and I, I'll definitely let you answer this because aircraft are definitely different than, than ships in the grand scheme of things, especially what they're made out of. Um, what features of Lake Huron are the most destructive to aircraft on the bottom? Is it temperature, muscles, anything else? It's muscles, there's no question about it. So if you look at some of the Navy airplanes that were recovered out of Lake Michigan back in the 1970s and early 1980s, now things were a little different because of the nature in which those Navy airplanes crashed. They were taking off and landing on makeshift carriers. So they were going very slow. They weren't doing gunnery exercises. They were hitting the water relatively gently. Most of the pilots got out safely. And then they went down, they sank to the bottom of the lake. Um, but when they, when they started finding them in the 70s and 80s and recovered a handful, they were shiny and practically brand new. And at least several of them, I think three, have been put in, back into flying status. They were that well preserved. With the introduction of the zebra and then the quagga mussels, they changed the whole chemistry on where they colonize. And unfortunately, because of the nature in which they live, um, and, and attach and defecate, uh, they're changing the water chemistry in the immediate vicinity of artifacts, especially aluminum. And aluminum is being greatly corroded because of the colonization of mussels, unfortunately. Yeah, so I believe that uh, had they not showed up, it would make my life a lot easier as a conservator because that's my biggest nightmare is trying to arrest and stop that corrosion that that is induced by the zebra and the quagga mussels. The aluminum artifacts that we're finding under the sand are infinitely better conditioned than those that are exposed in the water column and are being colonized. So it's hands down, it's the invasive mussels. And here's a question that I think almost all archeologists get at some point, where is the funding for this project coming from to do the study recovery and conservation? So the vast majority of the funding is uh, the National Museum, the Tuskegee Airmen, that's Dr. Brian Smith's organization. Uh, he's getting it through grants primarily and, and corporate sponsorship and donations uh, and individual donations. So that's the vast majority of that. The state of Michigan is contributing some of it in the form of my participation salary, the DNR conservation officers participations, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's mostly grant money. And then most of the personnel that were involved in it, like you, are coming up here on, on your own time and your own dime. And, and uh, sometimes you can kind of work it so you're at least getting paid salary to be here. Um, I but, was just going to say, it's a donation from the National <laughs> Museum of the Great Lakes. It's a donation from the National Museum of the Great Lakes, and, I, and it's greatly appreciated. So <laughs> but the vast majority of my crew are, are volunteers here spending money to, to come here. 
and to assist with this project. So. Excellent. All right. Sorry, I'm just, they're still coming in. Um, uh, uh, somebody wanted to know, do, does there, is there any indication that the plane may have exploded upon impact? It, it didn't explode in the sense of a, a fiery explosion. So, but it did come apart, you know, with, because of that impact with the water. Um, the eyewitness accounts, there were three other pilots in that formation. And then there were a, a few folks that saw this accident occur from shore because it's only a mile offshore. Uh, all saw pieces coming off the forward fuselage. And now we know because of that synchronization issue, those pieces were the propeller blade or one of the propeller blades, then the second propeller blade, and then fragments of that forward fuselage are distributed between the propeller blade and where the primary impact was. And so that whole nose of the airplane was going apart while it was still in the air. And then when it wing tipped into the water and then flipped, all of that stuff just smacked the water and just kind of went out. So no, no fire explosion. Um, but a great amount of stress that occurred through that accident. Um, <laughs> well, I know the answer to this because, well, as an archaeologist, uh, Margaret wants to know, will you be writing a book? Have you published any articles? And will your son produce a documentary about all the, with all the video he's taking? And I will tell you, the boy takes a lot of video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes to all of that. So, um, I've written several articles that have already been published. I've got a couple of chapters of books that are regarding aviation archaeology that are in press right now. Uh, ultimately, I think I'd like this to be my doctoral, uh, you know, research. Um, so we'll see. But there's definitely books coming out. There are, if you go back to the, the final page of my presentation tonight, there are a lot of links to um, video documentaries that have been produced and some online literature. So yes to, to all of those answers. All right, excellent. Um, and then one of the earlier questions, Neil, I just kind of want to leave this uh, towards the end as we're wrapping up here, um, just because you were talking about all of the aircraft that have sank in the lakes. Um, Neil was wondering, is, is he correct in the latest aircraft crash in Lake Huron was in Tawas Bay this past summer? Yeah, there was a small, I think it was a home-built aircraft that went down in Tawas Bay. And just about the same time, there was one that went down in the Osaba River, very near by each other, but both hit the water. Um, fortunately, uh, no, there were no fatalities involved in that. And both of those aircrafts were recovered. And so uh, I maintain a kind of a, a list of everything that ends up in the water and I'll a lot of times the airplanes are recovered, but not in their entirety. And so someday, perhaps somebody might find a, a landing strut or a wheel or an instrument panel or something off Tawas Bay and wonder, you know, what's the deal with this? And so I try to keep track of all of that stuff. What was recovered? Was it recovered in its entirety or not? That sort of thing. Um, and so just like shipwrecks that occur, sometimes the shipwrecks recovered in its entirety and it, it's refloated and moved on to other things in its lifetime, but only after it jettisoned a lot of its cargo, only after there were scars in the lake floor where there was dredging involved, that kind of thing. So there are these telltale signs that something happened there, even though there's not quite a wreck there anymore, but there might be pieces and bits and parts. So, uh, so yes, you're, you're correct. And, and of course, air aviation accidents are going to continue to happen over the Great Lakes. There's uh, just that much traffic and just, you know, it's, it's just a matter of statistics, I guess. Yep. Well, Wayne, this has been fantastic, as always. You are um, engaging and so, like I said, so knowledgeable at the beginning because, you know, I'm, I'm learning things from you <laughs> when I'm on site and even, even here tonight. Um, so thank you so much for your time and your, your joy and your energy in this topic. It's, it's, um, I don't know, it's, Makes me excited to go back again. I'm ready to go. Awesome. Let's go All next right. year. I got, I got um, signed up next year already. So. Excellent. Uh, so to those of you that are that are here and those of you online, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Our next lecture in the fall series will be on October 28th at seven o'clock. This will be live and in person um, with Wendy Coley, who we, we will also be doing um, a Zoom with this as well. She'll be here to regale us with tales of Lake Erie, murder and mayhem. Perfect for those 
few nights just before Halloween. Um, Wendy is an author by of the, of the book by the same name, and so there is an option to purchase that book when you sign up for the um, for the program on the twenty eighth. Uh, and if you come to the come here to the museum, I'm sure she will be happy to sign it for you. Um, please don't forget, if you are not a member of the National Museum of the Great Lakes, now is a great time to join at nmgl.org backslash membership. Um, and so thank you for all of you that have been here with us tonight. Stay healthy and stay safe, and we will hopefully see you again in four weeks. And have a great night. Thank you again, Wayne. Right. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.